Dr. Valérie Ayer, researcher at the Institut des, Etu uh, des Autres Etudes sur la Justice à Paris, and currently fellow at the Keta Hamburger Center Law as Culture. In her lecture, Valérie will give us insight into her research project, Lady Justice and Her Avatars. The second lecture will be held by Professor Dr. Anne-Marie Bonnet, professor at the Department of Art History at the University of Bonn, and currently as well fellow at the Keta Hamburger Center Law as Culture. Her lecture will deal with the topic, the myth of the autonomy of modern art in artists in relation to the networks of legal juristic and economic contingency. Both topics are situated at the intersection of law and the arts. On the one side, aestheticizing the law in the virtue metaphor of the figure justice, justitia, and on the other side, the juridification of aesthetics by declaring the aesthetic sphere in modernity to be autonomous in a normative sense, protected by rules of non-intervention into the field of art. This is the reason I thought it makes sense to treat both research projects at one occasion. It took a long time to find this, but in the end, uh, I think there is really a subjacent link that seems to be rather interesting to be discussed in the further, uh, during our further proceedings. We have to see whether this assumption of a symmetric problematic will hold true. Let's start with the project of our good friend and always admirably kind and helping lady Valérie. She explains, that's you, by the way. <laughs> she explains, and I may land in a first step her proper words. Lady Justice is uh, the only cardinal virtue still highly recognizable today. It is because she was used to allegorize an institution. What are the conditions of the afterlife of images in the long duration? As a female body aimed to entice the viewer to step in her spatial frame, Lady Justice is one actualization of the various, uh, of the various female allegories which haunted the city spaces and the ephemeral festivities of early modern cities. The, she stood out as a civic allegory. The allegor uh, allegorical body, often perceived as an immutable and repetitive concept, may give, gain more insights if we look as it as a fragmented entity. This hypothesis will be explained by looking at the uh, allegorical body as a symbolic operator for various symbolic, symbolic processes. So the topic is not completely new to our center, and of course, by the way, uh, José García has written a wonderful treatise about the subject of the eyes of justice, and Valérie Ayer has written a remarkable critique for Droit et Société. It did not come out yet. Not yet, but we can read it in the future. She herself has been working about the gestures of Lady Justices against, uh, again, another part of the body. A study about the knees, the swords, the corporal habitus of Lady Justice would make sense, thereby confirming her thesis of a fragmented entity. My own installation about the deconstruction of Lady Justice that was exposed here for a while is going the same way. But now let us listen to Valérie's talk for reasons of time, only a short look at her scientific itinerary. Dr. Valérie Ayer studied modern literature at the École Normale Supérieure à fontenay aux roses à Lyon, as well as at the universities of uh, Paris, Sorbonne, uh, Nouvelle uh, Sorbonne, Paris 3, and um, uh, Paris 7 from 1996 to 2000. She also studied art history at the Ecole de Louvre in 2006. 
2005, she gained her PhD in History and Civilization at the European University Institute at Florence with a dissertation on Mens Emblematica et Humanisme Juridique, le cas du Pegmacum Narrationibus Philosophicis de Pierre Cousteau, à Lyon, 1555 de Valérie Ayer, where she received the European University Institute Prize for the Best Interdisciplinary Thesis in 2006. Subsequently, Valérie taught in France, Tunisia, United Kingdom, and Cyprus. By the way, the countries uh, that we, or where we have a certain passion for and income. Following her teaching activities, she worked as a research associate at the Erasmus House and the Foundation Bodmer in uh, Colombie. Since 2014, she has been working at the Institut des Autres Etudes sur la Justice à Paris. So this is perhaps not so well known at, uh, in Germany. Uh, we should absolutely have the opportunity to invite uh, Antoine Garapon. Uh, he is the director of this institute. And uh, he has very similar uh, insights and perspectives uh, to bring uh, the social sciences and cultural studies uh, in a direction to grasp better uh, the law that is so complicated to be understood and deconstructed, etc., etc., and disenchanted. <coughs> she also became a member of the editorial board for the journal um, Emblematica, an interdisciplinary journal for emblem studies. Since April 2018, Dr. Valérie Ayer is fellow at the Kerta Hamburger Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities, Law as Culture here at our center. And this means, if you're able to count correctly, and we have only the right to host our guests for 12 months, that this is exactly the month then that you will leave us. So it's very, very nice that you give us a lecture of adieu. Um, and thank you very much for being with us, for having been with us all the time during this year, and for giving us now a look into your laboratorium. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Oh, that's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for this very generous presentation. And um, I would like to stress how uh, this uh, research period has been uh, stimulating in every way and uh, very, very profitable. And uh, I'm very honored to have been a member of this center. So, Lady Justice and her avatars, symbolic gestures, embodiment, agency. Legal history is mainly a history of the text. Law is a text, that is to say, a species of linguistic capital subject to norms of conservation and procedural rules of reproduction. But the dynamics of law and justice cannot be reduced to written codes. All legal documents, insofar are uh, as they are performative, oath, contracts, obligations, take place within a field of vision. The importance of the body in delivering the law, albeit its self-evidence, has been somehow left unexplored. In, in Justinian's words, glossed by Pierre Legendre, 1993, the, I quote, emperor carries all his laws in his breast. End quote. For centuries in Europe, Christ has been the living embodiment of the law of God. Robert Jacob even proposed that the birth of the early modern judge is grounded in the very act of holding an image in front of him. Ever since the technique du corps, techniques of the body, first appeared in print in 1935, the name Marcel Mauss has been associated with the establishment of a field devoted to the study of gesture as simultaneously a biological, social, and psychological phenomenon. Moses' prescient contribution was to recognize that all three factors manifest their influence not only through stated beliefs, but even more fundamentally 
through specific movement patterns, some linked to ritual and aesthetic practices, others to the manipulation of tools. Moss was, of course, not the first thinker to treat bodily techniques as culturally significant. It is difficult to Im imagine a theory of gesture that would not take uh, the contribution of the paleoethnographer André Leroy Gourand into account. He was the first to treat gesture explicitly as a discipline through which society imprints itself on the body and a, a conduit of agency through which the subject I innovates and departs from the script. In the particular case of symbolic personifications and allegories, the important point is to see how gestures can be semanticized and made to mean something in a particular culture. Lady Justice is not passive. She bears arms in the form of a sword, and the scales are a device she uses for the weighing of evidence in order to come to a just judgment. The analysis of the peculiarities of Lady Justice gestures observed over a long period should allow for the identification of record traits of iconic virtus and the migration of judicial symbols uh, via their representations. Methodologically speaking, the method advanced by Abby Warburg and his circle, Kassirer, Panofsky and Wynne, uh, built around the central idea of iconology is particularly concerned in the pursuit of a diachronic approach, uh, the one of the afterlife of images since antiquity. Warburg emphasized the unconscious charges of these image migrations by distinguishing engrams, which in contrast to symbols, are also transmit, transmitted sorry, by social memory. So how are ethical values, norms, and ideals embodied? I wish to gain some understanding on how gestures bear the moral order, expressing it, disputing it, or resisting it. Giorgio Agamben, in his notes of, on gesture, quotes from Varro, De Lingua Latina, according to which the expression res guerere is used to mean carrying something out in the sense of taking charge and taking it upon oneself, assuming responsibility for it. To which Agamben comments, I quote, what characterizes gesture is that in it there is neither production nor enactment, but undertaking and supporting. In other words, gesture opens the sphere of ethos as the most fitting sphere of the human, end quote. Critical concern about what gestures conveys, about what kind of meaning it carries, dates back at least as far as, as the Protestant Reformation, when debates over the performance of sacrament sought to secure a distinction between true belief and the bodily image of devotion, or merely going through the motions. My talk will be divided in four moments, uh, the first one, handling the scales, a subjective agency. The second one, the embodiment of equity. The third one, Lady Justice fingers. And the last one, gestures of measurement. So instead of focusing on the impersonal uh, agency of the scales, the allegorical posture of Lady Justice insists on the subjective agency of its user. As Massimo Leone has insightfully noted, parts of the human body have been used in ancient Egypt to bind the weighing process to an, an, an uh, embodiment of adjudication. In one of the coffin texts, it's a collection of ancient uh, Egyptian funerary spells written on coffins to thousand, um, a thousand uh, uh, before Christ, uh, weighing is personified in demonic form and the dead addresses Re uh, with a prayer for help. I quote, save me from this god with occult shape whose eyebrows are the beams of the scales. The curious image of the eyebrows beams stresses the subjectivity of a weighing procedure generating by the emotional reaction of the judge as seen expressed on his face. In other visual representation of the weighing of the soul, the penis of thought seems to be a part 
of the indic indicative system of the scales. Let's start with the exam examination of Giotto's allegory of justice in the Arena Chapel of Padua. Uh, the inscription under justice has been only partially preserved. It reads, I quote, perfect justice weighs everything with balanced scales, and it's being her duty to crown goodness, she wields her sword against vices. All things rejoice in freedom if she herself reigns. Whoever acts with consideration acts with delights. On account of justice, the knight goes hunting, they sing and play. End quote. Panofsky has noted that Giotto's justice is distributive. She embodies the dispensing of reward and punishment only. But the other aspect of justice is hinted at in the uh, fragmentary inscription, which mentions the peaceful pursuit of commerce. The personification of justice weighs two statues in her hands with the help of scales. Um, on the left, a small um, a small winch figure acts as a symbol of reward. The scene is damaged, but, if, um, but it can be noticed that a winched female figure is shown as about to crown someone sitting behind a bench. On the right scene stage in the other pan, we can see a punishment scene, a decapitation, wh where a male figure raises his sword, uh, his sword above a kneeling figure with his hands tied behind his back. The example of Giotto's fresco is crucial for our purpose. Not only ju uh, justice is represented as gesturing herself at the, as the central axis of an anthropomorphic scale where her own body is in fact engaged in the instrument agency, more importantly, the depictions of the small figures in both pans are also bodies caught into meaningful, meaningful gestures. The pair of scales is seemingly floating in front of her, inv invisibly held by divine wisdom. She sits enthroned in majesty, wearing her virgin veil, the mantle of the Mother of Mercy, and the closed crown of the Queen of Heaven. This example is a true mise en abyme of her gesturality. Lady Justice is not an impersonal agency. Instead of holding her attributes like static banners, she weighs in the pans of her balance two miniature figures of living people who interact and move, attracting the viewer's attention. A criminal is beheaded. A uh, reward, so this is the, um, the, the depiction of reward, uh, where you see the figure crowning uh, someone sitting be behind a bank or a bench. So this is uh, the uh, reward of, of the pursuit of commerce. And the, the reward is given to a man specifically distinguished by the peaceful activity of commerce. He is sitting behind the bunker of his shop. In a passage from the work Force Clavigera, Ruskin has emphasized that two types of justice should be considered. On one side, says Ruskin, there is the blindfolded figure with a scale which meets out reward and punishment mechanistically. On the other side, there is Giotto justice in the chapel of the arena, a female figure personifying, personifying sorry, Christian judgment. One which, sa which says Ruskin, I quote, feels with sensitive human hands the measure of culpability and merit. So this is the other um, pan with the punishment scene. Um, in Stones of Venice, Ruskin has added his, this description. Justice, uh, I quote, justice is holding scales not by the beam, but one in each hand. A beautiful idea showing that the equality of the scales of justice is not owing to natural laws, but to her own Im immediate weighing causes in her own hands. Justice weighs not merely the shares or remunerations of men, but the worst of men, and finding them worse this or that, she gives them what they deserve, death or honor, end quote. The symbolic value of these gestures is corroborated by their reuse by Ambrogio Lorenzetti in a, an extensive um, 
elaboration in Siena uh, Palazzo Publico in the Sala dei Nove. Lorenzetti portrait of justice on the northern wall of the uh, Palazzo B Publico in Siena closely follows the same scheme. He too shows angelic figures labeled as distributiva and commutativa hovering above the pants of a balance held in the figure of divine wisdom and steadied by the hands of justice. Though the mechanical nature of the balance exemplifies what Lorraine Dalston and Peter Gallison have termed mechanical objectivity, in this case, the delegation of judgment to a machine in order to free it from subjective bias functions quite differently. And it's because justice assess the equivalence of crimes and punishment. The balance of justice dangles from the hands of justice herself. Giving justice a body also turns her into the pedestal of her balance. Strangely, personif personifying justice and presenting the balance as her personal attribute does not particularize justice, but universalizes it by casting the goddess as a divine immutable, immutable mobile. The foundations of justice are relational. They lie in the connection between a goddess and the balance. The handling of the pens of Lady Justice Scales is also present in a fresco by Niccolo di Pietro Guerini um, in the vault uh, of the Church of Santa Felicita in Florence, painted in uh, 1387, where the influence of Giotto is manifest. In this case, the scales are even reduced to the figuration of one pen only. You see here. Um, another drawing by Giovanni Guerra uh, shows a virtue, justice, using her hands to equi equilibrate the pans of her scales. Giovanni Guerra I, had a strong interest in personification and was a genuine inventor with a marked originality. He played a decisive part in devising the illustration of the 1603 edition of the Chronologia <coughs> by um, Cesare Ripa. But the influence of this scheme lasts longer than it might be expected as a study drawing um, here uh, for the decoration of a lunette in Hudson County Courthouse in New Jersey uh, City, dating from 1910, also figure, figures Dame Justice holding the, the pans of the scale in the open palm of her hands. So the way Lady Justice's body becomes part of the balance itself is a recurring theme. A similar observation can be made for the allegory of um, justice uh, by a Sinese painter, probably the school of Domenico Beccafumi, now preserved in the Museum of Lille. Here the scales are posted on Lady Justice's head, uh, Lady Justice's head, as if the fulcrum of the instrument would be located inside her brain. By adopting this arrangement, the painter intended to signify that the decrees of justice are the fruit of the mind. On one of the pens, so you can't see here, but uh, it's uh, it, because it's almost uh, this picture is not very good. But one, on one of the pens of the scale is written fidus, on the other amor. The painter believes that a certain amount of sympathy and confidence is indispensable. Uh, to the satisfactory exercise of justice. Now for the embodiment of equity. The concept of equity is one of the paradoxical ideals which is regularly depicted by emblematic Im images or symbolic creations. Um, already applied in late antiquity by Latin church fathers to describe the Christian ideal of justice, Aequitas includes not only a measure of equality and proportionality derived from the, Arist the Aristotelian tradition, but also charity and indulgence in special cases. Equity as a concept is the creative element for the development of law. A famous passage from the Sententiae by Isidore de Seville uh, included later in Gratian's Decretum, reads, I quote, 
Everybody judging righteously has to keep a pair of scales in his hand to give the same weight to justice and commiseration. But by justice, he pronounces the sentence for transgressions. By mercy, he moderates the penalty so that something is corrected by equity according to the right standard, but something is foreborn with commis commiseration, end quote. A curious emblematic montage makes a similar point. It is an emblem created by Juan de Solofano y Pereira called Statera Regum, Balance of Kings. The picture shows the two pans um, next to both ears of, of a man's face, um, which serves as a, a pivotal point. The scales are held by a crown head protruding from a cloud. This curious montage is, is staged in such a way as to frame the spectacle. The image is a visual depiction of the principal Audi et alteram partem, here the other side, as judge should hear both sides of every case and each party should have a right to be heard. And throughout the early modern period, the Latin maxim, Audi or Audite et alteram partem, was regularly inscribed in courtrooms and town halls. We have a little comment here. This principle is often depicted by visual inventions. In an, in an uh, anonymous ivory sculpture um, that you can see here, it's about uh, 1600, 1625, uh, the sharp hand of the fulcrum of the scales points directly precisely towards her right ear in order to make visible the principle of here, the, the other side. Um, now, Lady Justice fingers. Um, Lady Justice is probably one of the few allegories depicted as, a, uh, as an ambidextrous body, using both hands equally well. Uh, André Chastel has indicated uh, the richness of the approach uh, of studying gestures. Gestures are specific thresholds where signifiers convey signified entities. The expressive gesture stands as a key feature in the enhancing of the effective power of the, com the composition. And visual symbols allow us to see a rather complex um, concept all at once. Uh, as a representation of the unrepresentable, if you think of, of Blaise Pascal and uh, uh, ideas about justice, which is always uh, d'un autre ordre, the symbolic body of Lady Justice offers one complete image of a complexity which is more accessible to intellectual intuition. Lady Justice is not a mere sign which stands for an abstract concept. In a seminal article, Ernst Gombrich has highlighted the blurring between representation and symbolization by which early modern allegories were conceived and understood. Reflection on the proper figuration of justice exceeded then the idea that allegorical compositions were nothing but expression of conventions. On the contrary, the effort to reconstruct the appropriate form to design justice was a serious endeavor, and it dealt with the quest for the spiritual essence which is embodied. Lady Justice's gestural, uh, gestural system is complex and varied. It involves bodily and facial gestures. Variants are oriented to the left or to the right, and their symbolic uh, perception is always influenced by orientation. Um, the, my favorite example is a um, uh, coat of armor that is kept in the Louvre, so it's an anonymous coat of armor, where Lady Justice is depicted in this part of the armory. This is uh, quite obvious, the orientation, the, the, the right arm has to be decorated by the allegory of Lady Justice. Um, Justitia repeatedly challenges beholders to experience different levels of engagement. Her keen eyes 
So this is um, a, um, a hint to Chrysippus' uh, description of the Portrait of, of Justice. She has um, keen, uh, a keen glance. Uh, her, her keen eyes trigger intuitive and emotional reactions, while the careful weighing, the ponderation of the scales, induces a ratiocinative uh, uh, and intellectual movement. Her body is frequently treated as a nexus of multimodality, where archetypal, archetypical sorry, uh, gestures are reduced to minima. Uh, in an unusual uh, engraving invented by Henri Goltius, uh, um, executed by um, his stepson Jacob Matham, um, Lady Justice's middle finger deserves attention. Um, an unusual detail, the movement of Dame Justice's salient middle finger is patent enough to deserve a close analysis. It probably alludes to a symbolic correspondence which, uh, with the mystical interpretation of Christ's fingers, as it is, for instance, explicitly developed later in um, The Life of Christ by Johann Eberhard Scheifler. I quote, his hand, uh, so it's Christ's hand, has five symbolic fingers. The first one, the smaller one, the little finger, signifies obedience, the second finger, called ring finger, was in relation with the piety of our Savior. The third and middle finger, which is also longer, stands for justice with its triple articulation, restitution of extorted property, debt payments, and punishment of crime, mm -hmm. and etc., the fourth and the fifth. This rare detail reveals a wider symbolic nexus where each of the five fingers of the hand, mm -hmm. modeled on the patterns of Christ's symbolic fingers, are paired with a virtue. This detail refers to practices of the late Middle Ages, where the hand, frequently used as an instrument for counting, served as a, a mnemonic device for the contemplation of the passion. This arithmetical piety enjoyed the persons praying to train in the virtues in a very practical way. Andrew Goldsius shows that he's, he's well aware of these uses of mnemonic hands. The training of the virtues is a key aspect of understanding how symbolic practices influenced daily life. Dame Justice's middle fingers becomes a powerful point of articulation between divine and human law and it also renders how the hand, instrument of instruments, according to Aristotle, may serve as a transmitter of ethics and as an ethical guide. Henrik Goltius often alluded to the, um, the uh, distinctive physiognomy of his own hand in his printed work, as his right hand had been severely burned when he was only one year old, leaving him crippled for life. The artist's hand became something like a signature. He did a number of drawings of it and even used it while traveling as a legal testimony to prove his identity. With the example of the outstretched middle finger of Justitia, Goldschuss shows how the hand becomes the locus of virtues where each finger joint may serve as a metonym for a very concrete mnemonic art. Now another uh, intri intriguing gesture, the horn gesture, as an apotropic manner of holding the scales. So here um, it's, it's a quite rare uh, example. One example of Eustitia's finger postures deserves a, 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 an analysis. A painter <coughs> issued from the circle of Lucas Kana the Elder um, has painted Justicia left hand in an unusual but telling position. She holds the balance in a typically apotropaic gesture intended to ward off bad luck. Um, the, this is a famous example, the belief of the malocchio of Yetatura, the evil eye inflicting harms of misfortunes is commonly associated with protective measures such as a horn gesture. Um, this gesture appears here in Fra uh, Filippo Lippi's portrait of a woman with a man uh, at a casement, kept at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, where uh, the soon-to-be-married young woman's uh, fertility is to be protected. 
um, the pictorial representation of the horn hand gesture in, in a secular setting where Lady Justice holds the scale in, in, using a mano cornuta aimed downward like a suspended amulet points out uh, a, a particularly intriguing detail. Um, when directed towards the, sc the scales, the gestures may suggest that the instrument itself is in danger of be bewitchment. Justitia needs to protect from the ev evil eye the balancing power of the scales. Cranach allegories shows that uh, justice hands does not only hold a, a conventional attribute. Her fingers indicate a supplementary meaning and the scales need to be cautiously handled. They are used as a prolongation of her body. In a later engraving, um, by Jacob de Gain II, dating from 19, uh, 98, uh, 1598. Uh, the same horn gesture is present, uh, but this time it is explicitly directed towards a gruesome th theater of punishment that you see here, um, <coughs> situated at, in, in the background of the scene. Apotropaic gestures are part of Lady Justice's legal ritual. Ritual symbols are not mere signs representing things already known. They are felt to possess ritual efficacy and to reveal their powerful agency. Uh, another uh, way of um, describing uh, Lady Justice's gesture is to, to see how uh, intriguing are the uh, deictic uh, in, um, index. In this anonymous drawing um, dating, uh, attributed to uh, uh, Lambert Lombard, almost in profile to left, Lady Justice shows her, um, uh, is shown lifting her scales in her right hand with an index emphatically pointing towards heavens in a particularly strong deictic gesture. The pointing um, index finger draws attention to the frame of reference where the mute but eloquent body acts and reinforces the persuasive rhetoric of the allegory by offering to ground abstract ideas in concrete actions. This emphatic gesture embodies the binding force of the law. Its expressiveness in, is key to understand allegorical conceits. A pointed index alludes immediately to the silent rhetoric of the orator. The hand gestures appeals particularly to lawyers and orators, as uh, they are trained since ancient times to use a specific gestural method in order to perform their pleas. Um, another example of a strong deity gesture is provided by Sebastian Locher in his marble uh, relief crafted in 1536, representing earthly and divine justice. To the left, we see an architectural landscape of Renaissance buildings, and in the background, a city on a hill. The figure of Lady Justice is seen leaning on, on a pillar with a powerful deictic gesture, the index pointing towards divine justice, here represented as a God the Father into heavenly uh, clouds, you see here. In front of her, a winch puto here holds, uh, holds out scales towards her with his right, right hand and points with his left hand to a sword lying beneath the globe. The puto asks in vain Lady Justice to recover her attributes and exercise worthy justice. However, Justicia turns away from her attributes and refuses to take hold of them. Pointing ahead divine justice, she renounces her power to exercise an imperfect earthly task, standing on crumbling foundation, which are hinted at in this tower here, especially down there. Um, in a later depiction of um, Lady Justice uh, in the allegorical program of the Salon uh, of the Manor House uh, uh, of the Saxon ruler um, in Radebeul, that you see here, the painter Christian Schibling has depicted 
as depicted 14 life-size virtues in the shape of uh, baroque moving female figures actively engaging the viewer. Justitia, placed on the south wall, points an index towards the spectator, involving the viewers into uh, the con contemplation of heroic virtues. So here uh, again, her strong deictic gesture shows that uh, she has a strong uh, communicative uh, role. Um, I will probably skip this one, which is rather obvious, and go to Bernardino May's Allegories of Justice of 1656. Here you see a particularly um, interesting ideal of harmony. In his colorful composition, Justitia lies in the foreground. The innovative feature brought by, by uh, the painter Bernardino May is to depict her as reading the code. So you see here, um, it's uh, rich in uh, uh, institute. And um, while well, she is reading the code as, as a partition while playing the uh, musical instrument of uh, justice. The open book at the bottom left uh, is the Corpus Juris Civilis, and she seems to be depicted as a musician deciphering a partition. Um, which would be the legal code, and interpreting law as she were using her sword as a bow and her scales as a violin. Uh, see in particular the way she holds both attributes. According to Hesiod, the law is graceful and musical because she's based, uh, because, because, sorry, it is based on harmony. Hesiod dis described with great emphasis the good effects of law administered uh, under, um, under the authority of the those. Uh, he insists that the result of responsible governance will be uh, thriving cities and prosperous people. And Eunomia, says Pindar, is a daughter of Themis and may signify fair melody as well as laws uh, well observed. So by depicting a very expressive gesture, Bernardino May invents a gesture linking laws exercise to musical harmony. I will end my, my um, talk today by uh, gestures of measurement and by a, a quick comment of this particularly uh, intriguing um, drawing. Excuse me, you have really 10 minutes mm -hmm. easily, ah, okay. easily, <laughs> so you can really relax. Thank and you. And we will have to I see, just see <laughs> the images. No, 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 no. It's, all, it's okay. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, here you see Lady Justice captured at the pivotal moment of a symbolic task. This Lady Justice is based on the use of systematic measurement deliberately uh, displayed. These drawings is Pence, uh, Georg Spence answered to Durer's nemesis based on a careful delineated canon derived from Vitruvius proportions. Vitruvius had given simple numerical relationships to offer the right proportions of human bodies. For instance, the height of a man is measured by the height of eight heads or uh, of ten faces from chin to airline, hairline, with similar relationships for other parts of the body. The fruit of Durer's research appeared in two of his treatises, and especially in the four books of human proportion. Penn's drawing follows the same conviction. Beauty is a drawn figure depending on a system of measurement. He depicts a powerful female nude in profile against a neutral background. Mathematical proportions for the female nudes are emphasized with hatched lines creating a greater sense of depth. Durer had explored the study of human proportions by drawing a vast gallery of standing nudes with table of anatomical dimensions. Here, Gold, uh, George Pence follows this line of inquiry by offering another perspective. Human measurements are not only the basis of a geometry of beauty, this mathem mathematical theory of beauty depicts the idea of distributive justice. 
The outstretched right arm of Lady Justice holds a pair of scales, and this type of scales is a direct quote uh, from uh, Durer's Melancholia, uh, searching again the, the, the very um, uh, the, the, the link, the obvious link between um, Pence uh, and, and Durer's um, uh, work. Uh, the, lines, the line of the eyes of Lady Justice go through the fulcrum which caused the pants to be balanced. The sword's edge touch, touches the top of the scales here. In early modern treatises, it is quite common to find a remark on measuring as a source of problems. The consequences of this lack of standards were far-reaching. The absence of precise measurements was felt to affect trade as well as justice. Some progressive lords decided to take the problem into their own hands. In 1554 in Mantua, the ruling Gonzaga family commissioned a set of new standards to put an end to the disorder that vexed merchants and citizens alike. Milan more ambitiously standardized its system and tried to expand its use to the whole Lombardy uh, region uh, between 1597 uh, and uh, 1608. So metrological chaos seems to be a common parading of the time. Moreover, Renaissance mechanics had intense debates about the correct treatment of the equilibrium of the balance. The behavior of several types of balances would then be scrutinized by mathematicians such as Guidobaldo, Cardano, Tarataglia, and Giordanus. One of, of the questions was how to locate the rotation point of the balance. Should it be located above the balance or below it? These two kinds of balances react differently when they are brought into an inclined position. Uh, so in the 16th century, the debate on different balances and kinds of equilibrium had assumed a dynamic that is hard to uh, expect today. Plato in the laws, um, 746e, uh, advocates the standardization of all weights and measures as a source of social justice, while in the politics, he introduces the principle of the mean, namely that the arts as well as politics should, should, uh, should search for the just proportion, which is the best guarantee for virtue. Um, so this drawing uh, by, by Pence opens up issues about the right gestures for measuring and also echoes the vividness of meteorological debates uh, at, at the time. So uh, I'll just come to my conclusion. Uh, this inquiry has tried to transfer attention from the instrumental to the expressive uh, aspects of Lady Justice gestures. In this case, the evidence of gestures is enhanced by the fact that Lady Justice uh, is, an, as I said, an ambidextrous body. We often find the, the saying, gestat outraque manu. Uh, so she, she holds uh, in both hands um, uh, an instrument. Uh, allowing the power grip pattern of wielding the sword to the precision handling gestures needed by the scales. And as I said in my, my first uh, conference, this is a pattern of the prehensile um, uh, it's a, the, the basic of prehensile movements, according to the famous paleoanthropologue uh, Napier. They are, uh, they are, you have two ways of, of holding an object, the power grip and the precision handling. So precision handling would be, in this case, and power grip, the, the sword. Um, so in... In methodological terms, allegory is susceptible to an analysis that balances a semiotic trend based on iconology, concentrating on meaningf meaningful topoids or, or signs, to a more phenomenological depiction, <coughs> focusing on effects of, of presence. Abby Warburg had 
forge the notion of pathos formal to, to show the afterlife of gestures. Gestures are related to a dynamic anthropology, and in the case of Lady Justice, it, is prob it probably explains her survival in the very long duration as an allegory which is still recognizable today. Thank you.